In this video, we'll continue our discussion of personality by learning about how psychologists measure and assess personality. We've already learned about the Big Five Personality Inventory, which is obviously a very widely used and popular personality test, but today we're going to talk about at least two or three more types of personality tests, and we're really going to formalize that and learn about how tests differ from each other, some of the pros and cons of different psychological tests, and so on. So to start out, we've already talked, like I said, about the Big Five Personality Inventory. This is an example of a structured personality test. Structured personality tests are also sometimes called objective tests, and they're typically self-report inventories, which have pros and cons, as we've already discussed in previous videos. These are typically answered on a scale as a series of very direct questions, and you answer, you know, one to five, strongly disagree to strongly agree where you fall on that question. Another example of a structured personality test that we haven't yet learned is the MMPI and its various iterations over time, like the MMPI-2 and the MMPI-2RF, the revised version of the MMPI-2. This test takes about one to two hours to complete, and it produces a, a nice clinical profile composed of 10 scales, hypochondriasis, depression, hysteria, psychopathic deviance, masculinity versus femininity, paranoia, psychoasthenia, which is sort of obsessive and compulsive qualities, schizophrenia, hypomania, and social introversion. So there's a lot of great things we can get from structured tests such as the Big Five Inventory and the MMPI. We haven't yet talked about projective personality tests, however, which is, are a bit different. Projective tests are personality tests in which people interpret ambiguous stimuli and they rely on this projective hypothesis taken basically from Sigmund Freud. The projective hypothesis is the idea that people will project their personality onto ambiguous stimuli. So a skilled psychoanalyst, for example, could use responses on a projective test to measure personality. There are several examples. We won't talk about all of them today, but I'll, I'll highlight two, and that was the title of the slides you saw earlier. I will give a disclaimer first, which is that the validity and reliability of projective tests are widely debated. So take all of this with a grain of salt, but there is some evidence to suggest that expert clinicians with lots of experience can have success and get a lot out of these tools. But again, take it all with a grain of salt. I just want to tell you about them because they're so widely used. One that you've probably heard of is the Rorschach inkblot test. And let me just give you a couple examples of what this looks like. So you would be asked to interpret this ink blot. It's an ambiguous stimulus. What do you see? And some good and common answers that we tend to see are like a bat, a butterfly, a female figure, perhaps a moth. If you answer something like a mask or an animal face or a jack-o-lantern, this is said to be associated with paranoia. And saying anything insulting about the female figure could be a sign that you're projecting your own negative body image onto this ambiguous stimulus. Again, this is how this would be interpreted. A good and common answer for this one here is a four-legged animal, uh, perhaps lions, pigs, bears uh, on the sides, butterflies, a rib cage, maybe even a Christmas tree. We see these sorts of answers all the time. Now, the abundance of colors here is designed to represent an emotional spectrum. And discomfort with this ink blot is typically associated with social anxiety and even emotional disorders. This is how this would be interpreted. A second type of projective test is called the TAT, the Thematic Apperception Test. I like to call this the Tell a Tale test because we keep the same TAT acronym, and telling a tale is exactly what people have to do in this test. You tell a tale about a picture. That is, you're presented with a series of pictures and you have to create a story or a narrative about what is going on in each. So let me give you a couple examples. Here's one picture you would be asked to tell a tale about, and you might be prompted with questions such as, what's going on in the picture? What happened right before? What's happening right now? What are the uh, different people in this picture thinking or feeling? And what will they do next? And here's another example. There are several of these. Now, in terms of uh, interpreting responses on the TAT, the story's content is said to reveal the subject's attitudes, fantasies, wishes, 
inner conflicts and maybe even the view of the outside world, whereas the story's structure, the timing, the order, things like that, usually reflects the subject's feelings, assumptions about the world, and an underlying attitude of optimism or pessimism. Does something good happen at the end? Does something bad happen at the end? That can indicate, again, optimism or pessimism. Now, I wanted to talk about one last concept related to measuring personality before we end. I'm going to read this paragraph to you. Apologies that it's a bit wordy, but uh, we'll get through it together. And I want you to think about how well this uh, paragraph applies to you. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. You have a great need for other people to like you and admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not turned to your advantage. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. Disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. At times, you have serious doubts as to whether you have made the right decision or done the right thing. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. You pride yourself as an independent thinker and do not accept other statements without satisfactory proof. You have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. At times you're extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you're introverted, wary, and reserved. Some of your aspirations tend to be pretty unrealistic. Security is one of your major goals in life. So how well does this paragraph apply to you? Well, in one study, students took a personality test and they all received feedback like this, regardless of how they actually responded on the personality test. When asked to rate how well this paragraph described them, most people said it really, really described them. On a scale from zero being, it describes me very poorly, to five being, it describes me very well, the average among this group of participants was 4.26, which is a very high score. Now this reflects, this situation, this example reflects what we call the Barnum effect, which is named after the showman P.T. Barnum. And this sort of a thing is used by psychics and fortune tellers to create the impression of supernatural abilities. The Barnum effect is the idea that people are quick to believe feedback about themselves, even when that feedback is vague enough to apply to just about anybody. You can pause the video and look through some of these statements I made. A lot of these would apply to just about anybody, and yet we feel like it really is tailored to us. And the Barnum effect is a pitfall of some personality tests because someone who's attempting to validate a personality test that they created, for example, can't simply ask someone if the assessment that you gave them is accurate. Not only can we not be certain how uh, truthfully a person responded on this test, we also don't know. It's also possible that your personality test may be accurate, not in an interesting, important way, but only because the results are broad enough, are not specific enough, such that they could be applied to anybody.